Praise the Lord. Happy Sabbath. I'm glad you're here today. That's one of my favorite songs. I'm sure it is yours too. It just hits every aspect of life, doesn't it? But the bottom line is what? Somebody say it. I'd rather have Jesus than all of these other things, right? And so that's your decision, your choice today. Praise God. That's what we want. And you, you know, all we always do before we open the word of life. And, you know, we want fresh bread, don't we? we from heaven. So we, we need to ask once again for the Holy Spirit to send. Send the Holy Spirit to give us proper understanding of His Word. If you can, we want you to kneel with me as we pray together. Kind, loving, Heavenly Father, we do thank You for the privilege of prayer. We do thank You that we can call upon You. You promise to hear us. And so today, as the bread of life is broken, we again we pray You give us the fresh bread from bread that you only heaven can give us today. Help us to receive it with thanksgiving. Help our hearts and minds to be open. We may discern the hour in which we live in the coming of Jesus. Lord, I ask for forgiveness of any sin in my heart and life that needs not be there. I do want to hear your sweet voice today, and I know your people want to hear your voice. And as our hearts now are open and our ears are open, may we hear and see Jesus is my prayer. In his name we pray and for his sake. Amen. We're going to talk about, a, I guess I'll lower that down, see if it'll come down for us. There we go. We're going to be talking <clears throat> about this subject because I think it's very, very important that we get a good understanding. And it's a little different. You say, well, I've been through this before, but we're going to look at it, we pray, in a little different way than maybe we looked at it before. It's going to take us maybe, you know, at least two parts, maybe three parts to get through it because of the subject and because of what we will be covering. It is heavy duty. Some people think it's not important, but as we study this message, you're going to see, I pray like never before, what the Holy Spirit is revealing that the hour in which we're living. What's going on? We must understand this prophecy. There's so many beautiful truths that hinge on this prophecy in the book of Daniel. The two books that we should be studying in this hour are what? The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. The book of Daniel, remember, with the book of Daniel had a lot of things written in there, prophecy. And, and, and what did the Lord say? This book's going to be sealed until the time of the end. Keep that in mind because a lot of the things we will talk about, many people try to take those things Right. And they try to make them apply somewhere in a, you know, different, you know, several thousand years ago. But remember, the prophecies of Daniel are for the time of the end. And the book of Revelation is simply a what? A revealing of Jesus Christ, a, a revealing of Jesus Christ. So, you know, the Bible talks about an hour. We're going to be talking about the 2300 year or day prophecy. This is very important. Remember, so many doctrines teachings, truth, hang on this, 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 this prophecy. And we're going to miss them if we're not careful to say it's not important. We will miss these beautiful truths, and I'm going to bring some of those out here in just a little bit. Do you realize Paul knew in the New Testament that God had appointed a day in which He will judge the world? Now you know in Daniel 8, 14... It talks about the prophecy of the cleansing of the sanctuary. The Bible says 2,300 days and then shall the, what? Sanctuary be cleansed. People's mind go ever which way. Please don't do that today. Let's take things in systematic order, look at them, evaluate them, weigh them out by the weight of evidence, and then you make a decision on it. 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Interesting, Paul in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, it says, God has what? Hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world. Did, did somebody hear that? God has what? God had appointed a day in which He will judge the world. But interesting, when you talk about the three angels' message, and we'll get in that a little deeper as we go, it says that we are in the hour of God's judgment. People laugh at that. And yet Paul said there's a day, God has appointed a day in which He will judge the world. It's very interesting. 
when you look up in the, you know, the, the, the original language and you look up, he hath appointed a day, it means a certain day. Not just any day, but a certain day in the history of the world. God has appointed a day. Do you think it's going to surprise God to say, well, I don't know which day it's going to be, but there's going to be one. He knows exactly what's going to take place. And he said, why? Because he wants you to know. When Paul made this statement, this is background. We're going to look at a lot of it. We're going to look at a lot of background because it's important. Paul, in the previous chapter, he continues on with this verse when he said, God hath appointed a day. And he uses the word because. He was making a point because. He had just made a, listen carefully, he had just made a call to, uh, of repentance for the people. Now remember, the day we live in, we need to what? Be repenting, repenting of our sins. Remember John the Baptist, Elijah message, get ready for the coming of Jesus, repentance. He had just given a message of repentance, and then what? He gave a message of repentance because of the judgments that were coming. So if we believe that we're in the judgment hour, the judgments of God are falling, then we need to be repenting of our sins, getting our life right. I want that to make sense to everybody. And so he said, God has appointed a day. He either is telling the truth or he's not. He either is an apostle or he's not. He's led by the Holy Spirit or he is not. We'll have to decide that. Remember, and they're, and they're talking about here, in the context of the scripture, it is a certain day that he's talking about. And the Bible gets clear in Daniel 8, 14, 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Again, if we've not been studying the earthly sanctuary, we will not know the importance of what I'm talking about. Now, remember this. When it says, and you have in your Bible, I know Daniel 8, 14, and it talks about days. Listen carefully on this because people get it confused. It's very easy to confuse it because the devil wants you to be confused. He wants me to be confused. I'll explain in a minute why he wants us to be confused because I would go into many of the beautiful truths that we're missing if we throw this out. And you don't want to miss the beautiful truth of Jesus, right? Your Lord and your Savior. When it says in there that he's appointed a day, he's going to judge the world. And when you say 2300 days, that word days simply means, listen, it means evenings and mornings. Are we there? The days, evenings and mornings, that, those words are comparable to the evenings and the mornings in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. When God created this world, He said the what? The evening and the morning were the first day. An evening and a morning constitute one whole day. Does that make sense? It constitute one whole day. Now, let me say why I'm explaining that. Because many people, many people have tried, they've tried to make the 2,300 day evenings and mornings, they try to make those 1,150 days, they try to make them half days. And why do they try to do that? Because what they try to do, they try to make it line up with something big that happened in history. Because when you have a prophecy, something big must take place. Historians must write about it. It must be in Scripture. It must be something you go back and say, Ooh, this happened on a certain day because He has appointed a certain day. Do you remember? But they couldn't do it because they were trying to say these are our half days. 1,150 of them. And so in order to try to make it line up with something, they took the 1,150 literal days and they tried to make it stick to the uh, destruction of the, of the temple by uh, Antiochus IV. You remember that? If, if you're using those things, I encourage you, I implore you, please throw those things out. You will see the significance of it. Remember, the devil will always take the truth and he'll give you some air. Oh, yeah. Now remember, when it says evenings and mornings, it does constitute one whole day. You, cannot, you can't say, well, it's 23, half of that, then it's 1150. Why? Because they couldn't find anything in history to make it match up. So they said, oh, well, wait a minute here. Antiochus did destroy the... Listen, he nowhere, no way, no form, no fashion fits the prophecy. Are you still with me? You say, boy, you get a little excited about it. You better believe it because it's taken many, many Christians. It's taken them away from these beautiful truths that God has given and warnings. 
So I don't want anybody to be confused at all about that. Now, the prophetic period of 2,300 evenings and mornings cannot be half days. Okay, do we have that part? It cannot be half days or 1,150 whole days. Are you with me? Why? Just simple, because I've already talked about that. The Bible's talk. Why? Because in the morning, evenings and mornings at creation constituted, once again, what? A whole day. We must then consider 2,300 days to start with. Are we there? We must consider it because it's the same term, it's the same words that's used in creation. Is used here. So we have to consider then whole days. Not 1150 whole days or half days. You can't do that. And you know, we talk about days and not literal days. Why? Many, many commentaries. This is where you're going to get confused. If you're not careful, the commentaries that you go to, your mind will be just dazzled by all the different commentaries and men that are out there that's trying to put something. Listen, when the angel comes and the angel says, this, this, this is what's going to take place, this is how you match it up, we have to match it up all the way. There's specifications. If we don't, we can't be a fulfillment of that prophecy. And remember, 2,300, not just literal days. Why? Because the commentators have tried it over. And you know what? With no success. They've tried and tried to say, okay, then 2,300 literal days. But these commentators have tried to look in history once again and say, what happened, what took place exactly when they had the right starting point? What happened? Oh, oh, nothing. We can't find anything. No success to find any event in history that would fit that or the 1,150. There's no significant event. And I'm not talking about one event. I'm talking about several major events that are written about in history, written about in Scripture, written about in the spirit of prophecy. So you can't miss it if you want to apply your mind to it. So I would say this today, if we want to be consistent. Do you believe Scripture is consistent? There is a consistency in Scripture. Too many people are like, you know, in their Christian walk, they're like going to, anybody ever play handball in here? Well, bless your hearts. Woo-wee. It, uh, yeah, well, you know, handball, right? The ball, you take the ball, you hit it with your hand, or you can take a little, you know, a little racket and, and, and you hit it. But, you know, you can use side walls. Are you still with me? This wall, that wall, that wall, up, down, ceiling, you know. It, they just bounce every which way. Whatever comes and seems to be right, they just take it and say, man, this is the way. The only consistent way is to apply the year for the day principle. If you apply the year for the day principle, you will see. Now, why? Listen carefully. There's a reason for it. The time that we are looking for, I'm going to establish this. I'm going to take as much time as it takes to go over and over so there's no question. We need to understand this. God wouldn't have put it in there if it didn't make a difference. And when it's talking about the judgment, surely somebody in here or somebody out there, somebody somewhere is interested. If you're talking about the judgment and the end of the work, and Daniel said his book would be opened at the end of the time, just before Jesus comes, the judgment would take place just before Jesus comes. The next event after the judgment is the coming of Jesus. That's where we're at. We're really close to it right now. No one wants to talk about it. Preachers don't want to talk about it. People don't want to hear about it. No one's ever really wanted to hear about judgment. No one wants to hear about judgments falling. No one wants to hear about hard, difficult times. But Jesus seen fit to put it in the Word. He wanted you to know and me to know. So what's the only consistent way to apply so that we know what it's talking about here in evenings and mornings is we're going to apply. Now, again, the Bible principle, year for a day. Now remember, the time we're looking about, there's two things. The time we're looking for is number one, it's specific. What does that mean? It's a specific time. Does that mean it can just vary any way it wants to? Or is it a very certain day that Paul talked about? It's a certain day. It's specific and it's definite. Two things. Remember, it's not, well, it, I think, it seems we can half it. We can call it, you know, literal days. or We want to have to apply the key and we'll look at it in here on and on as, as we go. We'll give some Bible passages for this as we go. We're doing a nutshell now and the reasons why that we need to come together and say, what's this about? So the two things, specific time and definite time. 
And so as we read Daniel 8, verse 14, 2300 days, you'll notice in Daniel 8, 14, there is no definite date given. And when you have a prophecy, is it important to have the right starting date? If you don't have the right starting date, how can it match out? How can it? And you know what? If you have specifics in there too, if you have the right starting date, everything else will line up. If you don't, everything else will be off. So the devil wants us to have the wrong starting date. But it's easy from Scripture to find out the starting date. And we will do that as we go along. So if you're saying, well, in, in Daniel chapter 8, I found a specific, I found a definite time to start. You will be wrong. Because Daniel does not give a specific time. Now, Daniel chapter 9 gives a specific time of this prophecy. And we'll go into that deeper and the reasons why a little bit later on. And I'll just say quickly, you'll say, well, how come in Daniel chapter 9? Remember, listen, you think, was, you think Daniel was a godly man? Did he love Jesus? Was he a prophet of God? You better believe he loved Jesus. Did, he, did, did the Holy Spirit work mightily with him? Did the Spirit of God work? Oh, mightily did mighty miracles for him. But you remember with, 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 with Daniel... When God was showing him, listen carefully, this prophecy, when he opened up his eyes and he saw, right, in vision, this prophecy, it made Daniel sick. He was so sick he couldn't set up. He was so sick he couldn't eat. He was so sick that he laid many days on the bed and he couldn't give up because he just couldn't figure it out. Now, if a man of God gets sick, is somebody with me here? If the scenes that he saw taking place just before Jesus comes. How about us today? It's like, we, it just doesn't matter. Things are going to go on just normal. Things are going to go on just the way they are. They will not. The prophet Daniel was sick. We'll read that as we go and study it a little bit deeper. But I want you to know that. But the, there's a time that coming. 2,300 years. If you take the, day, the year for a day principle, and just quickly we'll say this. 2,300 years years reaches down deep in the Christian church. Did you, did you get it? In the Christian era. Yes. And then somebody will say this. Well, yeah, but it's referring to the, the, the sanctuary. It's, it's referring to the, the temple in Jerusalem. It could not possibly be as it was destroyed in what? A.D. 70. So when we talk about the, the, the sanctuary, what must we be talking about? You see... It has to be something to do with the heavenly sanctuary and more on that as we go. So there's information we have to look at. The sanctuary, let me tell you this, the sanctuary of the new covenant. People love just to, when they hear the word new covenant. They have problems with the old covenant. The problem wasn't with the old covenant, it was with the people. Isn't that right? Yeah. Same thing. Right? The sanctuary, though, of the new covenant is clearly the sanctuary in heaven. Are you still there? When it's talking about the sanctuary, it's talking about the sanctuary in heaven. Now, how do I know that? Because the book of Hebrews chapter 8, verse 2 says, Which the Lord pitched and not man. So it can't be that which is, you say, Mo Moses and the men there, you know, pitched. Pattern after heaven. But it's talking about the new covenant of the sanctuary in heaven. That what? The Lord pitched and not man. Hebrews 8, verse 2. Now, notice this sanctuary. This sanctuary is the one that Christ is the high priest of. Does that make sense? Hebrews 8 verse 1. The Bible is clear on that. I wish we had time to read and turn every one of them, but I'm telling you so you can jot them down. If you have an interest, you can read. So we're looking in the New Testament under the New Covenant of a sanctuary. And when it's talking about the sanctuary, it's talking about what goes on in the heavenly sanctuary. Which the Lord is what? Jesus is the high priest you know this? I'm sure you do. But if Jesus, you know, if, if, if Christ was walking the earth, which he did before, if he came back, he walked this, this earth before, right now, the rules of the Levitical priesthood, he could not be a high priest because of the bloodline. Did you get it? Our loving Lord and our Savior he couldn't even be, right? He couldn't even be in that time as he walked the earth a high priest because he was of the tribe of what? Of, of Judah. In fact, when I say this, it scares some people, but he was of an independent, heavenly priesthood 
after the order of Melchizedek, the Bible says. Did somebody get that? As soon as you say independent, everybody gets nervous, starts biting their nails. I don't. He had to be because he couldn't be of the earthly because, what? He was the tribe of Judah, not Levi. And they were a stickler on that, of being high priest. You see, John saw, John saw in vision. He saw a time that there would be a special attention that would be directed toward, notice this, you're looking up in Revelation 11.1. 1. John then was looking and he said what? There would come a time that there would be special attention that would be given, directed toward the temple of God and the altar, listen, and them that worship therein. There would come a time in the history of the world, we're talking about the time, judgment hour, that all of a sudden there's some special attention now that's giving to the what? To the temple. He's talking about the end of time. Wasn't talking about the earthly. It must have been be talking about the heavenly. That there's something going on, the eyes would be toward the heavenly temple. Because remember, what was done down here, what? Representative what? What's done in heavenly, the heavenly sanctuary. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. It's very, very important. He saw it. And in that same verse, Revelation 11, do you remember that there was a man there that he was measuring? He had a measuring rod, a measuring tape rod in his hand. Do you remember? And he was going about doing what? Somebody said he was going about doing what? If you've got a measuring stick in your hand, what are you doing with it? Some people don't know what to do with it. That's right. But if you have, usually if you go get a tape measure, it's because you're going to do what? You're going to measure something. And we realize in Revelation, as we looked, then what? The time would come when the focus of heaven, right? People, their mind would be directed toward the temple of God in where? And the altar and then that worship therein. The hour would come. God is measuring His people. There would be a time when there's special emphasis that would be placed. There would be a special time in the history of the church that the attention would be drawn toward the heavenly temple or the sanctuary to be cleansed or to be put right or to be justified. That's what it means to be cleansed. There would come a day that the heavenly sanctuary... And again, if you don't get this, it's okay. Just keep all this in mind the best that you can. Keep it in mind. Because I'm going to explain a little more of that as we go on a little bit is why. Some people don't get it at all. Why? Because they've never studied the, the priesthood. They've never studied the sanctuary. They don't understand about it. That's so, but listen, it's easily explainable as, as the sins are confessed. People say, as soon as you confess your sins, it's, it's gone. He's taken care of. In the earthly sanctuary, it was not. They were stored up till the day of atonement at one when the sanctuary would be cleansed. And I'll explain that step by step how that took place. All Israel understood it. All the Jews understand it. It's just us today in the Christian world says, I don't get it. Once you just say you confess. There's, the eyes are what? Going toward heaven. Who's in the heavenly sanctuary? Who is there operating as the priest did while he was here on earth? Who did the priest in the earthly sanctuary represent? Christ. Christ. And he represented the work that Christ is doing what? In our behalf. In our behalf. And I realize every little object, and you'll say, that, because he said to Moses, Moses, let them make me a, God said to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell. And after the pattern of the things that I show you in the heavens, a pattern must be something that already exists, the things that went on there. Man's mind just can't wrap around all of those things as it did earthly. But you know the work that's going on. You look at the earthly high priest and you'll see the work that Jesus has done, is doing, and will do for His people. That should give us encouragement, shouldn't it? That should give us hope. That should give us a lot of hope. Sanctuary cleansed. It's going to be purified. It's going to be set right. History of the church. Now remember this. What will help us as we study this? What will help to determine what event is taking place. Because what we're going to study, listen, is you cannot put a hole in it because history won't let you. The Bible won't let you. The spirit of prophecy won't let you. So let's come to grips with it that as we look at this. If we're looking to determine what event is taking place connected with the heavenly. If there's some events that's taking place, we need to keep this in mind. 
All we do is what I've been saying. Examine the earthly sanctuary. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. To determine what event is taking place connected with the heavenly. We're talking about the heavenly sanctuary. Do what? Examine the service of the earthly. For the pre Here's what the Bible says. For the priest, right, in the earthly sanctuary, served unto Hebrews 8 verse 5, served unto the example and the shadow of heavenly things. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. What did the earthly priest do? What did he do? He it served unto an example and a shadow of heavenly things. So what he was doing was what? He was commissioned by heaven to do it because that's what heaven's doing for us. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? So we have to study it. Because that's what the Bible says. Hebrews 8 verse 5. Did you get it? And to the example and shadow. I thought, wow. Example. Realize that word in the original language means example. It means a copy. Example, a copy. It's an imitation. It's a tracing. The only way I could ever draw anything when I was growing up is trace it. And I didn't do a very good job of that. But if you can trace the original, you've got something. There are men do that today when they try to, you know, copy something or make something look original, you know. Uh, some of the paintings and different things. Not necessarily trace them, but they make them look just like the original. The Bible said here, these priests, they served unto the example, the imitation, the tracing, the copy, and the shadow, which means the foreshadowing. The foreshadowing of heavenly things. Put it real simple here. The priest then served a, a shadowy example. Now, why do I say that? You'll say, well, it, because we see through a glass darkly. God understands who we are and what we can understand. So every little thing that went on in the earthly sanctuary as far as utensils, da, 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 da. We're not saying that's exactly. Right? The principle is there and what the high priest is doing is there. And it's legitimate today. And he's cleansing the sanctuary. Proven in Scripture, we're living in the hour of God's judgment. Two main divisions, keep it in mind, please. You know this, very simple, in the earthly sanctuary. Two main divisions, you can break it right down. It was the daily and the yearly. And so we can simply say, Christ, does He daily ministrate for us today? Yeah, He daily, right, intercedes for us today. He's our high priest today. It typifies the daily service in the, uh, in the earthly sanctuary. Then when you go to the yearly or the day of atonement, right? The yearly typified a work. Listen, that Christ would do at the close just before the world comes to an end. Did you get it? See, it's making sense. Let it build a little bit here. The yearly then does what? typifies what, what the work that Christ would be doing in the most holy place just before He comes back. Before smoke fills the temple. Before probation closes. Just before He comes back. How interesting that is. And then in Daniel 8, 14, then God, right through Daniel there, through the angel, uh, Gabriel, announces the time, Daniel 8, actually 9, announces the time of the beginning of the special work. In other words, if Christ is going to be doing a special work for His people, preparing us, right, to meet and spend eternity with Him, and naturally, he's going to announce that time. He wants you to know the time that it, it, that it commences. And so he, he, he gives that time 2,300 days. You say, well, is, are you sure it's at the end of time? This is not in the prophecy, but as we understand, you can apply it. We realize, as we study Bible prophecy, we realize when people want to talk about, well, what is the, 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 the beginning of the end or the end times? When does it really begin? 1798 would be a very good time specifying the end of time. From that time on, it began to be the end of time. 1798. So we begin to look at the things that are transpiring and taking place. And, you know, Daniel 8, 19 makes this comment, Daniel 8, 19. He says, what shall be in the last end of indignation? For at the time appointed, the end shall be. What is it? At the time appointed. See, it, on and on the scriptures get what? Giving a starting time. It's giving things that will try. And it keeps saying, at the end. The book of Daniel will be opened at the end of time. Go right and, and rest a while, Daniel, because you stand in your lot. It's not going to be in your time. 
at the end of time, the appointed time. And I can say this with all assurance. Any person who's studying on this, finding a fulfillment in this vision that we're talking about, in any kind of earlier period of time, like the Maccabees area, no, you're going to come up short of meeting the, what the angel said was the significance or the specifications. And if we miss it, then we're, we're going to be misleading and it's going to be erroneous. It's going to be an error. Did you get it? Most people, they try to apply this time frame we're talking about because they won't do it the proper way in which the Bible says to do it. They apply it to the Maccabean area. That couldn't possibly be because they said the fulfillment will be at the time of the... Thank you, somebody. Will be at the time of the end. If that was not the time of the end or even close to the time of the end. So it can't possibly be a fulfillment there. Things that we have to really look at and really make clarify in our heart and in our mind. Would we say today that maybe this is the last and the longest prophetic period in the Bible? 2,300 days, then shall what? Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Huh. I thought that was kind of interesting when you, when you, when you read that. It's 2,300 days day, year, day prophecy. It's the longest. No one seems to be interested. And I want to say today, if we miss the significance of this prophecy, we will miss many Bible truths. We're going to miss many time frames that God has left for us. Because I believe He's left us a nice road map that we can follow based upon the Word. Many of these beautiful, beautiful truths... And I really believe this. If we've missed some of these truths that I'm going to mention in just a moment, is it possible we might miss heaven? If we can't see this, these beautiful truths here, and this is what's encompassed in the 2,300 days, plus many more. These are just the highlights of them. We, it might be deadly if we do. If we miss this prophecy, we will miss the time when Jesus began His work as our Messiah, the Savior of the world. Did you get that? Without Him, there's no hope. He wanted you to know the very year that He began His work as the Messiah. He was not always, as it were, the Messiah. He was Jesus, absolutely. He didn't. What did He do the first 30 years or so? What was He? What was He? Say it. He was the carpenter. But he began his work in the ministry. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Specific day. Don't, if you miss this, you're going to miss this. And then we've missed Jesus. We've missed our Messiah. You say, well, well I still know it. You missed that point. Be careful that we don't miss the very year that the Bible predicted he would die on Calvary. What would this world be without Calvary? The devil wants to take Calvary out of this prophecy. He wants to take the Messiah out of this prophecy. That's why he's determined to gouge in the middle of it and take out a portion of it. To eliminate Jesus Christ is exactly what the enemy wants. Please don't fall into his hands. And when a prophecy begins, you cannot ever stop it or take anything out of it. It must go to completion. Don't miss Calvary, He wanted you to know the year that He would go there. He wanted you to know what all surrounded that. If you don't understand this prophecy, we're going to miss the 70 weeks, the 490 years given to the Jews as a nation. You're going to miss that. And then everything else becomes confusing. Then we go in all different kind of directions because He did say... The 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. The word determined means cut off of. Cut off of what? The 2300 days. We'll get into that more and more specific. Oh, don't miss that because it just makes such a difference when you study the rest of the truths of the Word of God and you read the Word of God. It begins to fit. If we don't understand this prophecy, we're going to miss the very year that the message went to the Gentiles. Did you know that? 
the very year that Paul was appointed by God to do a specific work, right? Special work to the Gentiles. You're going to miss that because he put it in there, so it must be important. Hmm. If you don't get this prophecy, you know what we're going to do? We're going to miss the judgment hour message, the first angel's message of Revelation 14. For the hour of his judgment has, is come. We're going to miss the three angels' message that the last day church should be proclaiming and warning the testing truths before Jesus comes. How can anyone today look at those three messages right there, which is called the everlasting gospel to give to the world, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and say it doesn't matter? A message that calls to say, we're near the end of time, we're in the judgment hour. Christ, our high priest, like the earthly priest on the day of atonement, went into the most holy place with all the sins of Israel, cleansing the camp as our high priest. And that's why in Revelation 15 it says what? He stands up and smoke fills the temple. There comes a time when probation closes. Right after it goes through this as where it begins with the dead and comes to the living. We'll talk about that a little more as we go. Don't miss giving those three angels' message to the world. The beginning of the judgment hour, the very, you know, what the year that it began. The month. Specific time God wants you to know so we don't miss it. If we don't get this prophecy, the 2,300 year, day, year prophecy, we are going to miss the proclamation to be, uh, of, the, again, the first angel's message of Revelation 14. If, and we don't want to miss it because, you know why? One of, the, one of the important points is because it takes us back to begin to worship on the seventh day Sabbath. God said He'd raise a last day people that would proclaim that the fourth commandment is still binding. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God said there's going to be a repair of the breach is going to show up in Isaiah 58. They're going to be restore of the old past to dwell in, to walk in. God said there'll be people with a specific message to give. Why? Be, people say, why don't you talk about something else? Because most of the world believe that nine commandments are binding. Whether they do it or not, they believe it. So you're going to harp on all the others? Everybody said, we know it. No. We begin specific message that God gives. And the first angel's message is go back to the one that made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. So you go back to the seventh day Sabbath. If you don't know this prophecy, you might miss it. And most importantly, you've missed the God of the Sabbath. Seventh day Sabbath, important message to give. If we don't know the 2300 days, we're going to miss that Christ, notice this, ended His work in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. Did you get it? Because when he went back to heaven, do you remember? Where was he found walking? Among the what? He was walking among the candlestick, right? Where was the candlestick? Was in the holy place, the first apartment. There was a move that was made when he was seen that he was in the most holy place. So remember, if you don't know this prophecy, we're going to miss that a door was open that no man could shut. As Christ moved into His final phase of His work, He moved into the, what? As our high priest into the most holy place. This prophecy points in the very year that Christ moved from the holy to the most holy place. Just like the earthly priest stayed and did His daily ministration where? In the holy place. One time a year to get rid of sin forever, to say it's done, finished, complete. He went into the most holy, representing Jesus Christ, our high priest. Friends, this is important. You're going to miss that. Don't miss that. Don't you need a high priest? Don't you need someone, right? Standing between us and the Father, you better believe it. Pleading His blood. That's our only hope. That's our, and He's made it abundantly clear. If we miss this 2300 days, listen, if we miss it and we don't see it and we throw out a portion of it, we have, we have no mediator. We have no blood to cleanse us. We have no one to stand in the presence of God for us. We have no sacrifice because we've thrown it out. Friend, if we don't understand this, this is why I'm taking time on it. If we don't understand these things, we're going to miss the beautiful truths of the earthly sanctuary 
and the Day of Atonement. Psalm says, Thy way, O God, the way to God, is through the sanctuary. Don't miss it. If we miss these truths, we're going to miss the judgment hour truth and the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. And in the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, we will find that it starts, remember, with the dead. Those who have professed to have a relationship with Him. If it can be proven, and it can be on a shadow of a doubt, that when that began, and that's what we're studying and we're looking at, we'll get in specifics and date and history and Bible, that it began a long time ago, and it begins with those who professed Him, the dead, and then no one knows when it goes over to the living. And when that is done, the living, then Jesus will come. The world will not last another day. Every person's life will be gone over. This thinking we can live a life however we want and live it in halfway, half-baked Christian, it's not going to work. I'm telling you it's not. It's not trying to condemn me. It's not, I look at my own life and I say, oh God, I'm wretched. I need some help. But can we not do that today in our own life, to look at your own life and say, am I, am I heaven material? Will my life enrich heaven by the grace of God? We get, oh, and then we want to mince it and say, well, it's not your life. We understand it. The life that you have right now, if He translated you into the portals of glory, would it be a better place now because of that? Or would it be a worse place? I've often said that. And I look at my own life and I'll say, God, oh, have mercy on me. We're going to miss these truths the judgment hour, the cleansing of the sanctuary. And it begins where? With the dead. And it goes into the, the, continues on to the living. When that's done, the very next event is the coming of Jesus in the clouds of glory. Be careful. You've got to know this. Don't miss that prophecy points without question to the sanctuary in heaven. Without question. It's at the time of the end. This prophecy, don't miss it. It points to the victorious life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and His work as our high priest. Did somebody get that? Oh, please. This prophecy points to the victorious life of Jesus Christ. That's your only hope. That's my only hope. He's lived the victorious, sinless life where I've been dirty and vile and unclean and none good, no, not one. If we miss this prophecy, we miss the devil's trying to take out Calvary, trying to take out, the, you know, trying to say, oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, it does matter. Take out his death, his resurrection, trying to take, smear his work as high priest. Don't let him do it. He's working in your behalf right now. He wants to. And please, Please, if you miss this prophecy, you might miss the prophecy that points to a specific people in the end world. That can be anybody that wants to by faith except giving that three angels message, the last message of warning and grace, gospel, everlasting gospel, because it opens such a fountain of truth that most people, if they finally consent and give in to God as God, to say it's such a fountain of truth that I've never heard and seen anything like it in my life. What a joy that's made to my heart and to my mind. Oh, how things fit when they didn't used to fit. Or when I couldn't make them fit. When I thought that they fit, but they were a little bit crooked. It's like taking something square and trying to put something round. It just doesn't work. You might bang it and twist it and knock the corners off, but it's no good. Fountain of beautiful truths. And you know what? If you miss this prophecy, you're going to miss the time when Jesus talks about the blotting out of sin. Remember, there's a forgiveness of sin, the time, right? He forgives you, but then there comes the time, what? A blotting out, which is talking about like the Day of Atonement, when one day it's going to be, you'll say, well, that refers to the, what? I'll remember it no more. I'll cast it as far as the east is from the west. Remember, the sins, even though we're confessed, we're forgiving, in the earthly sanctuary, they were symbolically stored right there for that whole year. Until the high priest, ooh, representing Jesus Christ, right, came in, made a sacrifice for himself, and a sacrifice, and I'm gonna go into a little deeper next time, right, a sacrifice for himself and for the children of it. Remember, they could not be forgiven until the blood was applied, and the blood could only be applied in the most holy place one time a year during the judgment hour. 
So that's why they couldn't. And never, never, and was never intended, could the blood of bulls and goats and animals satisfy, right, a, a God, right, with His law. But it was something that was there, that by faith we would do until Jesus would come. That makes sense to me. Judgment hour. Last passage, Revelation 14, verse 7. We're just beginning to tickle the edges. I haven't got off of the first picture. These things are so important because the devil wants you to think that it's not. And if your eternal salvation is not important, then maybe it's not. If you don't care, then you don't care. But often said, listen, you're going to one place, you're going to heaven or hell, you decide what it's going to be. I believe that his, his blood is sufficient for my life. I don't know about yours. Is it powerful enough to cleanse you? Yes, it is. Does He want you there? Yeah. Is it possible to get, straighten your life out? Yes, no matter how crooked it might be, how dirty it is, He can do it. You just have to give Him permission to come in and do it. Ask Him to come in. Revelation 14, last passage. Turn with me, Revelation 14, verse 7. See what the Bible says. We're going to read with this. Revelation 14, verse 7. We've alluded to it. We've talked a little bit about it. Revelation 14, verse 7. The Bible said, talk about, remember, this is the three angels' message. Those of you that never studied, you never read it, bless your heart, please take time to read Revelation 14. You know, verses 6 through, what, 12 or so. Read the whole chapter. Because how do you get around when you see this angel flying in the midst of heaven? What does that mean in the Bible? What does it mean? You can look in, you can look in your strong. You do whatever you want to. But you know what? The, the angel here, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Simply an angel is a messenger. And in your strongs, you might even find this. I just kind of raced it out and didn't do it. Because it said, as a, as a pastor in the strong. Some of you look at, I just kind of crossed out. I didn't want to get that. Say, God has messengers. You follow me? An angel, God said, he, the angel's not going to finish the work. He's going to, you you are His messenger. You are His witness. Talking about the speed which this message will go, having the everlasting gospel. Who can knock that? We talk about the everlasting gospel, the gospel, except when it comes to this in Revelation, and all of a sudden it's not. The Bible says it's everlasting gospel, and this everlasting gospel is going to be preached to what? Dwell, all those that dwell on the earth, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. What I've been telling you about today and the three angels' message, first, second, third, I'm talking about here, is the message that the Bible says will go into all the world for a witness. It's going to be decision time. Way past it. This is the everlasting gospel. This is the total sum of it. This is the warning. And it said, the angel said with a loud voice so no one can sleep through it. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. A specific time, a certain day, a decisive time. Worship Him. Here we go. As soon as that angel begins to sound, then the message of people begin to gather around, and they begin to look and begin to say what? The Bible said, go back and worship what? The one that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. What did the people do who went through this time frame that we're talking about in the 1800s? There was a big disappointment. But through that disappointment, their eyes went to the Word of God and they found Christ what, what? working for us in the heavenly sanctuary. And then their minds and heart went back to the observance of going back to the one who made heaven and earth. And when you do, you go back to creation week and you go back to the seventh day Sabbath. These group of people will be preaching the seventh day Sabbath. They will be giving a warning to come out of Babylon, these religious organizations, right? The devil has just fooled. He's giving them false doctrines and teachings. They're just smearing them all around, twisting them and throwing them out there. And God says, give a call when they hear this message. Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sin. That's what the Bible said. Revelation 18 even gets a little more severe when you look at it. Read that when you have the opportunity to do it. Come out of her, my people. And then the people, right? A certain group of people give this warning of the third angels, the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast. And keeping a false day of worship when God said the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. 
Who here wants to challenge God today? Is there anybody big enough to challenge God today? I'm not. I don't dare challenge him. You might not say anything, right? but you know, he reads your heart, he reads your mind. I wouldn't challenge him if I were you. He will call your hand. He holds the whole world in his hands. I'm glad he has patience and love for somebody like me. I don't know about you. Giving me time. He's working on me. Is he working on you? You're going to have to do something with these passages. And we're just scratching the surface right now as we begin to do a, lot, a whole lot more. Why? Because you, you don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss all these things we've been talking about, plus much more. But if you don't understand this prophecy, you really will. And there's a possibility we'll miss out on heaven. Why? Because we've thrown out the high priest. We've thrown out his work. We've thrown out what he's doing for us right now. We don't know anything about it. Why? Because we decide to stay in the first department and not move to the most holy place where he's, where he's working right now. How can he mediate for me when I'm not with him? When the majority of the world is in the first department of the heavenly sanctuary or the work that's going on. And they, but why? Because they don't know 1844. They do not know that he moved into the most holy place, a specific time on it, and they did not move with him. Can't help us. We've got to move when he moves. It's his last stop. It's not that big a deal. You think about just what? Holy place and most holy place. But the work. What will you do with the work? What will I do with the work? We come together next time. We're going to go into more specifics of the Bible and historical accounts that we cannot miss it without throwing him out. Let's pray that God will open our hearts and our minds. See, we can say, oh, I'm not throwing him out. I know who he is. No. If you reject the truth of God's word, he is truth. You've thrown him out. Let's just be honest about it. I hear some of you fussing. Somebody will write me and say, you say you heard somebody. I know what, I know what you know, people. I know, I know how, you ever talk to anybody? You say, oh, I know what they're, they're fighting. It may not be anybody here, but people fight this. They think they can keep the truth and, and love Jesus, but throw out his prophecies, throw out what is truth in the word of God. No, this right here, this right here is going to decide, this deciding factor right here. If you love me, you keep him. If you love me, you're going to be obedient. If you love me, you're going to follow me. Remember where he said, wherever he goes, we need to follow him. Let's do that. Let's really, let's really just strive by the grace of God. We have closing prayer right now. Ask God to help us to say if he left us, a warning, a prophecy of 2,300 years. Again, we'll prove that all from Scripture, day for a year, all the business. We're looking at, well, again, we'll, we'll look at the historical documents. And this is when it started. This is how long. This is what took place. And we'll see it, it corresponds exactly with the work of the earthly sanctuary, which the priest did it, what was a shadow. They were doing the same thing, right? That the heavenly, what Christ is doing for us. We can't miss it. And what a blessing it is. What a blessing if we accept it in that being a curse if we don't. Let's pray about that our hearts and minds will be open that we may receive what God has for us. Let's kneel, shall we, as we pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that you said it was, it, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It rightly divides and separates, and it's always been that way, and it always will be. We give you permission to come into our hearts and our lives and to carve and to cut out things that it just doesn't need to be there. And a lot of times it's just our, our, our head and what's, what's between our ears that need to be changed, and redone, and committed to you so that you can take us and you can mold us and you can shake us, shape us into your image. Lord, we need to understand these things. We do not want to exclude you. There is no hope without you. Many in the world, by the millions today, they don't know you. They never accepted you. They, there is no hope for eternal life until they accept you as Lord and Savior like to say something more smoothing, something that just tickles the ears. That's not what the Bible teaches. That, that's not what you teach. So help us today. Our only hope is to rest in your care and in your love and in your mercy and to rest in those beautiful things you've left for us so that we need not be surprised or fooled as the majority of the world is how wonderful and how good everything's going to be till Jesus comes. It's not. 
You said it's going to wax worse and worse. We need to prepare for that in our relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, for hearing. Thank you for answering prayer. Thank you for opening our hearts and our minds that we may hear your voice in Jesus' name. Amen.